Good afternoon. It's great to see everybody this afternoon. Our text before the lesson is 1 Timothy 5, 8. 1 Timothy 5, 8. These are the words of God. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. May God bless the preaching and reading of his word. Amen. Please be seated. Over the past few years, the phrase Christian nationalism has been trending not only in the evangelical Twitter sphere, but on mainstream media platforms. Everyone seems to be talking about it, and yet there is great disagreement, it seems, as to what the descriptor means. Those on the radical left use the phrase as a kind of slur, an attempt to impute the sin of white nationalism onto all Christians in order to marginalize their political influence. Thus why they often add the word white to the phrase, white Christian nationalism. This propagandistic use of the phrase has led some more conservative commentators like James Lindsay, and Andrew Cuff before him, to argue that Christian nationalism, what it really is, is a carefully designed political trap. That it's a smear that's meant not only to marginalize believers, but to provoke them into another January 6th event. A Reichstag fire is the old phrase. That's what they're hoping for, is a Reichstag fire, which is an event that would then provide sufficient justification for widespread persecution of Christians. Now, in spite of these efforts at social and political manipulation, some Christians have decided to embrace the title of Christian nationalist, using it as a label for a more biblically robust political theology. This includes pastors like Doug Wilson, scholars like Stephen Wolfe, and writers like Andrew Torba. A counter tactic which in a way is very American, because we have a long history of embracing derogatory titles like Yankee Doodle or the more recent basket of deplorables. And it's also one which can be very effective. For example, some scholars suggest that the very name Christian that we bear today was originally meant as a smear, that it was given to believers in Antioch by Gentile critics and that rather than distancing themselves from it, the early disciples embraced it as a way of emptying the term of its metaphorical power. Such inverted approbation, or excuse me, appropriation, such inverted appropriation, as we might call that, also works, I'm sure you've noticed, with symbols, cultural symbols. We can think about how the LGBTQ plus movement has adopted the rainbow as their rallying banner, a shrewd strategic move to take the very symbol of their destruction from scripture and repurpose it for positive use. Now these kinds of skirmishes right over words are significant. We should not ignore them because the kinds of the kind of ideological war that we are in is, as much as anything else, a battle over who gets to control the words and the symbols of our culture. In fact, you might define culture, as I often do, as the very words and symbols that help us transliterate the sacred order into the societal order. And so these battles are important, and therefore they merit our attention. But the aim of this lesson today, and I'm sure you'll be relieved that I'm going to go here, but the aim of the lesson today is not to address whether it is rhetorically wise for Christians to adopt the label of Christian nationalism, but rather to consider for a moment the theology which lies behind that uh, title. A crusade which hopes, as I said, to recover a more biblically robust political theory, one which honors Christ as king and his teaching as the foundation for law and order. Now, in this, I do not intend to lay out an entire political theology. You know I could, but I will will restrain myself 
But merely, I just want to bring clarity to the discussion and to set some biblical parameters. And what I hope to accomplish today is merely a bit of ground clearing, to define a few terms and to draw one line in the sand. In doing so, I will be borrowing shamelessly from the writings of scholar Brad Littlejohn, whose work on this subject I highly recommend. So the purpose of this set of lessons, then stated more specifically, is this, to distinguish between three fundamentally different phenomena that are often conflated in these discussions. First, Christian support for nationalism generally, Second, something that Little John calls Christian chosen nationism. And third, the idea of a Christian magistracy. So I'm going to argue theologically for one and three, which I think together help to form what I would call a Christian commonwealth. And I'm going to argue to reject number two. So today's sermon is going to focus upon the first two of these, Christian support for nationalism generally, and a rejection of this Christian chosen nationism. Maybe another way to say this, to summarize it, would be is there is a difference between a nation that is Christian and Christian chosen nationism. So the first discussion point stated as a question is this can Christians be nationalists? Is nationalism consistent? with Christianity, a question that up until 15 minutes ago would have been answered yes by everyone, but now requires at least some justification. To provide that defense, however, and this is where things are going to, I'm going to violate the rules of preaching because I'm going to have sub points here, I'm sorry. But to provide that defense, I have to first define what is meant by nationalism. So it's clear in our mind, because again, there's a lot of equivocating that goes on in these discussions, much of which is on purpose. So it's, it's essential to have clear definitions. So we will very briefly focus upon two senses of this term, nationalism. The first is nationalism, national, nationalism as a theory of international order, and second, nationalism as a stronger word for patriotism. So first, then, nationalism as a theory of international order. In this, it's helpful to distinguish nationalism from imperialism, to note the difference between a nation and an empire. Let me quote Brad Littlejohn to clarify this. He writes, essentially, nationalism in this sense refers to a principled stance in favor of the independence and equality of nations. It rejects the essentially imperial political theory of ancient Rome and the Middle Ages for the idea that it is good for political units capable of effectively representing and defending their respective peoples to achieve, assert, and maintain independence. I'll explain that in just a moment. But imperialism, as he notes, was the dominant Christian view up until the Reformation, the Holy Roman Empire being the paradigmatic Example And the point of it often was world domination. But theories of international order began to change following the birth of Protestantism. And the thinking, as Littlefield summarizes, of much of Protestant political thought has been that as long as nations are capable of caring for their own people and they refrain from harming others, they should be given the freedom to develop and pursue their own interests. In this sense is what I mean, what we mean by nationalism. Now, just as an aside, this is not to say, or at least from my point of view, it's not to say that imperialism per se is wrong. For there are many goods associated with empire, especially the British Empire. As Niger Bigger has recently pointed out in an article for First Things that I recommend. This is what he says, in terms of what we gained from empire, it ended intertribal warfare, it brought humanitarian emancipation, it brought modern science and technology and moral and religious enlightenment to the benighted places and peoples of the earth. That's his terminology. 
You might think of it this way. Empire has aided in the spread of the gospel perhaps more than any other cultural endeavor. And in terms of fulfilling the cultural mandate, it stands preeminent. Now, following World War II, many biblical scholars began condemning imperialism whole cloth, arguing that it is inherently evil, that it conflates our cultural, you know, one cultural expression with the Christian religion itself and other numerous criticisms. This change of heart is understandable, of course, given what happened in the first two world wars. But I find their arguments unconvincing. Which means, then, that my justification for nationalism is more prudential. That all things being equal, a group of sovereign Christian nations would lead to greater flourishing and stability for civilization than colonies within an empire. Or maybe this is the best way to think of this, scripturally speaking. The image that we get in scripture is this, that Christianity itself is the empire, the kingdom of God is the empire, and that it rules over various nations. That's, in fact, the exact language that we find in Revelation 21. Now, when we think of the alternative to nationalism, we tend not to think of imperialism, but globalism. And yet globalism, although it's not sold this way, the way that we understand it today anyway is just another form of imperialism. Progressive elites may advocate for the erasure of all borders, arguing that national boundary markers are inherently xenophobic, but what they really desire is to impose their ideology on every culture. They want to expand their borders, not erase them. And that's why they work to teach gender studies in Zimbabwe and universities and other things. And yet, there are many Christians who would argue that love of neighbor, neighbor necessitates, you know, at least a kind of globalism. That if we are to follow in the footsteps of the Good Samaritan, we must open our borders and show true hospitality, at times even showing radical hospitality. But here's the thing, the love of neighbor does not require the forfeiture of one's national sovereignty. Borders, just like the exterior walls of your house, don't prevent hospitality. In fact, they make it possible because without them, you have nothing to invite people into. There is also this in Proverbs 25, 17, which says, set, seldom set your foot in your neighbor's house, lest he become weary of you and hate you. All this to say is that there is a limit to hospitality. And the borders of our nation are one of those limits. In fact, if you don't have limits when it comes to your hospitality, if you tear down every border, you will be enslaved. People will take advantage of you and enslave you. So there are limits to it. All of this to say that there's nothing inconsistent with nationalism as an international way of ordering people and Christianity. Okay, so the second sense then of nationalism, this is the one that's gonna be even more controversial. And that is, we speak of nationalism as sort of a stronger word for patriotism. So the question is, is it biblical for Christians to have a strong sense of patriotism? which Little John defines as not only pride in one's nation, but also a desire for it to succeed and flourish. The first of those is controversial with those who are very progressive, but the second part of that is controversial among even conservative Christians. And the worry, as Little John notes, is that this kind of national pride this kind of putting our nation first, this kind of national prioritizing, is somehow in tension with our universal allegiances to one another as members of the global body of Christ. In other words, how can we put our nation first if we have brothers and sisters in Christ in other nations who ultimately are owed our allegiance? The popular apologist Neil Shenvey in his review of Stephen Wolf's book on Christian nationalism, well expresses this concern. He writes this, the Bible teaches by both precept and example 
that our identity and our solidarity need to be primarily oriented toward God's people within the church and not around either, he uses the word ethnicity in quotes, what he means, means by that really is nation, not around either nation or even family. Right? Our allegiance ultimately is to be towards God's people. And in support of this argument, Shenvi cites the story of when Jesus is informed that his mother and brothers wish to speak to him. This is in Mark 3, 33 through 35. And he replies this way, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. From which Shenvi concludes this. Here Jesus himself is saying that his relationship to his disciples was closer than even his relationship to his own biological family. Now this principle that Shenvi is, is putting forward is true, of course. But it is a truth that must be balanced by what scripture also has to say concerning the priority that we are to give to our household, is the word that scripture often uses, which is to say the priority we are to give to those who are near us, both in terms of our duty and allegiance, which brings us back to 1 Timothy 5.8, which again says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Notice the distinction here between relatives who are farther off and the immediate household, which, by the way, in this context, would include non-relatives. There's a distinction that's being made. Those who are closer to us, is the implicit principle, are prioritized in terms of our responsibility. Again, look at 1 Timothy 5.4. But if a widow, that is to say a woman who's now in need, has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. And right? if there's a widow, it's not the church who has the first responsibility to take care of her, but her immediate family, those who are in her household. Or we can think of the scribes and Pharisees, the story that was read to us a little bit ago, whom Jesus rebuked because they were tithing their money essentially to the temple and neglecting their parents. It would be like giving all your money to the church, right? And, and your, your parents are starving or they are in need of your help. They need medical care or something and you ignore them. That is something that Jesus rebukes. So according to scripture, then there's a general ordering of our loves, which is prioritized the near which prioritizes, I should say, the near over the far. It prioritizes family or friend over stranger. And it prioritizes fellow citizen over foreigner. And not because those who are close to us are superior to those who are far. It's not because they are more worthy of our help or our allegiance. It's not that my family is better than yours. Okay, they are, but it's, that's not the reason why. I, I have a duty to prioritize them. It's because they are what God has given to me and given me to. This is an insight that comes to us from Augustine. So it's an old Christian insight. And it's simply just the recognition of the ethical import of divine providence in placing us where we are, in the particular family that we are in, in the particular city, in the particular nation. And to deny this proximal responsibility, particularly in our actions, is viewed in Scripture as a great evil. Here's another example. Think of the church universal. Okay. Shepherds, are not given the responsibility to watch over every Christian on the planet, right? That would be impossible. But they are to watch over the flock which is among them, which means that I will do whatever I can to help a fellow Christian, but not at the neglect of my own congregation. And the same is true when it comes to my loyalty to my nation which is to say that love of nation in that sense 
is right and good. The person whose loves are properly ordered is the one who loves his nation, who loves his fatherland, not the one who despises it. Now, if God places you in the city of Jericho, a city that, according to Joshua 6.17, is wholly devoted to the Lord for destruction, then it would be righteous to work to subvert its authority by hiding the spies, which one could argue is what's best for that city to be taken over by the people of God. But the point is, is that the gospel can act as a sword to divide these natural ties, just as Jesus warns. But notice that even that admonition presupposes the the priority of such natural ties. The point is that prioritizing the flourishing of our nation over others is no less biblical than prioritizing the flourishing of our family over others. I want to help your family flourish in any way that I can, but I cannot neglect my own family in the process. To do so would mean the denial of my proximal responsibility and render me worse than an infidel. The same would be true of one's responsibility to our nation. As I said, this is a long-standing Christian insight, and it's one that we have forgotten. And there are people still today, especially in the South, who still have a love for their nation, but the justification for it, the biblical justification for it, has eroded away. And so it is slipping. It's, It's viewed as you know, quaint, right, or unsophisticated. Well, you know, your Christianity is unsophisticated if you really love your nation, if you have a flag, right, in your building, right, which we'll talk about in a minute. That's so quaint, right? It's because we've lost the justification for it, the the robust biblical justification. And here's another thing. This natural love of nation should express itself in genuine praise. Just as when we give honor to our parents for giving birth to us, we honor our nation for doing the same. The word nation comes from the Latin word natio, meaning birth. And such honor should take the form of national days of celebration and the enshrining of origin stories in our public institutions. The same kinds of stories, mind you, that you pass down in your family which bring not only a sense of transcendence by connecting you to the past and duty, duty to the future, but also a sense of belonging, all of which are necessary for a meaningful life and a robust sense of identity. The very things, by the way, that we lack today. But I can hear the voices in my head, right? Of the criticisms, right? How can we praise predecessors who were slave owners, right? Or who committed atrocities against those who were indigenous to, the, to this land? And, and on and on the criticism goes of our age. Much of the criticism, of course, isn't even true. But of course, some of it is. The founders of our nation were not perfect. They were human beings and they were sinners. And some were worse sinners than others. So what do we do with that then? Can we still praise these men who owned slaves? These men who sinned, who were men of their their age? Well, first of all, it's unreasonable to demand perfection from our forefathers or from our parents, for that matter, as a condition of our gratitude. Only a spoiled child insists upon perfection before expressing his praise. Only a spoiled child does that. On the other hand, we must not turn a blind eye to their iniquity either. And I like the way that little John handles this. He says this, The pious man knows the sins and shame of his father, but modestly covers his nakedness like Shem and Jephthah, rather than exposing and mocking it like Ham. You know this story. We are living in a nation of Ham's in more ways than one. Those who love to expose and mock the shortcomings of their forefathers. 
chronological snobs, as C.S. Lewis called them. Which, by the way, is very easy for them to do because all these men are dead. Right? But, you know, if any one of these, you know, uh, sages of our age were actually in the room, you know, you take Ibram X. Kendi and put him in the room with John Adams, he would have his hands full. Right? John Adams had a, was playing with a full deck, as people used to say. Instead, our orientation towards our ancestors should be one that is based upon charity. And as Protestants, we once knew this. In fact, we were catechized in it. Listen to the words of the Westminster Larger Catechism. And I know we come from different backgrounds, and you may not, you know, you, whatever denominational background you might come from, but let's be honest, we were all Presbyterians once, okay? If you're Protestant. So I'd be the bearer of bad news, but that's history for you. So here's the Westminster Larger Catechism. The question being, what is the honor, what is the honor that inferiors owe to their superiors? And here's the answer. The honor which inferiors owe to their superiors is all due reverence in heart, word, and behavior, prayer and thanksgiving for them, imitation of their virtues and graces, bearing with their infirmities, and covering them in love, that so they may be an honor to them and to their government. We need to catechize our children to look upon our ancestors, our forebears, with this kind of charity, so that their hearts might be filled with gratitude, not resentment. All of which is to say that there is no inconsistency between nationalism in the sense of stronger patriotism and the teachings of Christianity. In fact, as I've argued, I think biblically, one is, barring you know, certain circumstances, one should be inclined to love their fatherland and to be filled with gratitude for what those who have come before them have done. Having considered the question of whether Christians can be nationalists, we will now, as a, the last thing we will talk about, is to examine an extreme form of nationalism that we must reject. What Little John calls Christian chosen nationism. A perennial temptation among thriving Christian nations is to believe that they are the chosen people of God, that the Almighty has selected their nation as the new Israel to be his people through whom he will at last establish his earthly kingdom. Little John puts it this way, over the past few centuries as Spain, France, Britain, and Germany each took their turn basking in history's limelight, each was tempted to think that it had been set aside by God for a particular world historical moment. And this is also true of the United States. It was particularly present in the founding of our nation with the notion of manifest destiny and its great millennial zeal. But it continues today as an extreme form of American exceptionalism is perhaps the way it's most articulated today. That we are a special nation, that we are indispensable to God's mission, which utterly ignores what God himself says about nations in Isaiah 40, verse 15, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Now, this is not to say that the success of America was not part of God's broader plan of accomplishing his mission. Of course it was. Neither is it to say that when God promises that righteousness exalts a nation or that blessed is a nation whose God is Yahweh, that he doesn't keep those promises. Of course he does. Rather, it is to say that there is a great difference between God's providential blessing and his covenantal blessing. That's how little John puts it. God has not entered into a special covenant with the United States as he did with Israel, to use us as a unique agent for his purposes. Rather, he has raised up our nation because of our faithfulness, and he can just as easily tear us down because of our unfaithfulness. 
Indeed, I would say in the best case scenario, America would be just one Christian commonwealth among many. We're just one more. And we love our land, right? But so do the other Christian nations. And so we would all be equal. And so therefore, Trump is not God's anointed. Please, no one say that to me, okay? He is not. Don't put it on Facebook. Don't put it on X. I will unfriend you. (laughs) Don't worship the flag, okay? Here's something interesting. There's two flags up here. This is the Christian flag, and this is the flag of the United States of America. The protocol, and I learned this recently because now I can hang two flags outside my house. But the protocol when you display flags, when they are of the same height, is that the superior flag goes to the right, just as this Christian flag is, right? And the inferior, right? The the nation versus the empire, you might say. So the representation here is right. This This is the order that we have to keep things in. Now, having said that, in fighting for my nation, make no mistake, I'm fighting for my home. And therefore, I take it very seriously. But I have to be careful not to turn my home into an idol, just as we don't want to turn our family into an idol. There are times when the sword of truth must sever such natural bonds. And when it does, we must pledge our allegiance to Christ and not our country.